An NGO claims China is using kidnapping and coercion as tools to bring wanted fugitives abroad back to the country. All this in violation of international law. Today, the NGO Safeguard Defenders released its latest report, Involuntary Returns, China's Covert Operation to Force Fugitives Back Home. Now, the Communist Party calls these repatriations voluntary returns, but Safeguard Defenders argues they are anything but, such as the case of China's one-time most wanted corruption suspect, Yang Xiuju. Now, this is her in 2016 being escorted off a plane upon her court return to Beijing. A former Communist Party official accused of embezzlement, she arrived from the United States where she had been in hiding. Safeguard Defenders claims her family members had been threatened in China, forcing Yang to return. The NGO claims there are three main methods that China uses to coerce overseas targets to return. First of all, as in Yang's case, pressure on the target's family in China. That ranges from threats to harassment and public shaming to actual detention of family members. If that doesn't work, China will dispatch agents to whatever country the target happens to be in to use more direct methods of persuasion that can include intensive surveillance and stalking. And if those means are exhausted, the report documents case studies of covert teams actually kidnapping and smuggling people back to China. Now, it's all part of China's so-called fox hunt and Skynet programs that seek to bring back fugitives from abroad and cut their access to finances. But as the report from Safeguard Defenders says, China's actions violate international law. The NGO's campaign director, Laura Hearth, explained how that was the case. As you pointed out, uh, China, I mean, the CCP is breaking international law, national sovereignty of at least 120 countries, as their official statements uh, point out. Uh, on a regular basis, what we've documented in this report is that the campaigns that have started in 2014, uh, reinforced in 2015, and again in 2018, um, Fox Hunt and then Skynet, the so-called anti-corruption campaign, where anti-corruption is to be taken very broadly, uh, basically hunting, chasing uh, dissidents, activists, uh, a growing number of people trying to flee China, as official numbers indicate, uh, everywhere in the world. Now, instead of using official legal mechanisms, which obviously we've documented, they're increasingly trying to do, abusing the Interpol system, trying to have right. people extradited or deported. However, the majority of of people, and, and we're talking over 10,000 people that have been returned since Operation Fox Hunt started in 2014, uh, according to official data by the Chinese government, um, the majority of these people are returned to so-called irregular means. Now, the irregular right. means, again, are documented in official statements by the Chinese government, by official party and state organs. Um, and these, we call them involuntary returns, uh, where they operate on foreign soil, where they harass right. people on foreign soil, people that are protected, and coerce them or even kidnap them uh, and trap them to make sure they right. return to China to be prosecuted, you, to be disappeared. You, you talked about uh, uh, illegal means. I mean, China has something like 60 extradition agreements, almost 60 extradition agreements with different countries. Why is this not a viable uh, legal route for China? So one thing is they state that they use these irregular means, these illegal means um, for countries where, you know, extradition may be difficult, where there may be no willingness to sign extradition treaties, to sign judicial cooperation treaties. Now, first of all, this is a lie because the you know, over 30% of the cases that we've documented, and these are only the tip of the iceberg, have taken place in countries where such agreements are in place. But obviously, because of the judicial system within China, uh, they're facing increasing difficulties to have people extradited because, you know, there's been mass accounts and also by UN bodies clearly stating of the torture going on, arbitrary detention and forced disappearances, the certainty of an unfair trial if extradited to China. So increasingly, they're facing these difficulties. So obviously it's much right. easier to actually harass, threaten or even outright take people and bring them back to China through these irregular means.
You talked about about 120 countries where such uh, illegal operations are taking place. My question is, are countries not aware of these extrajudicial means that China is employing? I mean, for instance, how are Chinese agents able to operate under the radar like this on foreign soil? So one of the things that we clearly ask governments to do is to urgently investigate and expose these practices, because in a lot of cases, we do think countries are not necessarily aware of these um, operations taking place. Obviously, one of the side goals of these kind of operations is also to coerce people into silence to make sure that they not, do not report these kind of instances. Um, this is all done also to instill a sense of fear in the community that they are not safe anywhere, that they're not free to speak up anywhere, that their family back in China may be targeted, that they may be visited um, by thugs, by police officers abroad, that they might be kidnapped. So that's one effect which makes it obviously difficult to monitor these practices and to provide adequate protection uh, for these people. But in other countries, we've seen that they have become aware and are maybe not necessarily investigating uh, enough other countries still, especially authoritarian states, um, partner countries to China may even have been cooperating willfully with uh, Chinese law enforcement to actually conduct these kind of illegal operations, irregular operations, um, you know, with their silent uh, complicity. So there's a right. big a big problem going on. Um, and as you said, they might be using, you know, police officers might be using uh, tourist visas. In 2020, we exposed such an agreement with Switzerland, where actually police officers were granted sometimes tourist visas by the Swiss authorities, and they might have conducted these kind of operations. Other countries like Italy, from where I'm speaking of, has these kind of uh, agreements with Chinese police enforcement agencies uh, for so-called, you know, tourist purposes where they may right. come and patrol and help control the Chinese population. So th there's various degrees of cooperation, complicity and unawareness. But this needs to stop now because, you know, it's a threat to national sovereignty, to human rights, to freedoms everywhere. Uh, briefly, uh, Laura, what should countries be doing to uh, stop uh, these illegal activities? So the first thing is exactly to investigate and to expose these practices for too long. And still we see many countries adopting a kind of hush-hush approach to the continuous violations of international law in this aspect, but also in other aspects by the CCP, uh, by PRC authorities. So the first one is to really look into this. Again, this is linked to also their obligations uh, mm -hmm. of each country, of these 120 countries targeted under international treaties to protect and defend human rights on their soil. So they need to install adequate monitoring uh, mechanisms, reporting mechanisms for these communities mm -hmm. and make sure they are uh, protected, investigate, expose. Um, also, you know, put a price on these kind of violations. As I said, right. I mean, many of these operations are being carried out in countries that have judicial cooperation agreements or extradition treaties with China. These need to mm -hmm. be suspended. These need to be um, looked at. What is happening? Why is this happening? There needs to be a price on these kind of uh, violations of national sovereignty right. and human rights everywhere. Obviously, we hope especially members of parliament may take this up as a matter of urgency with their governments and make sure these practices right. are exposed, talked about. Laura Hart from Safeguard Defenders there. Now, Beijing's repressive tactics extend not just to transnational justice, but also press freedoms. And nowhere has that been more visible than in Hong Kong. In recent months, well-known media outlets such as Apple Daily, Stand News and Citizen News have had no choice but to shut shop. It's prompted several journalists to abandon Hong Kong for safety abroad. DW's Joyce Lee meets some in democratic Taiwan. Just two months ago, Alan still had hope for his future as a journalist. He brought his press cards with him when he moved from Hong Kong to Taipei. But they are now worthless after the Hong Kong news outlets he worked for shut down amid pressure from Beijing. I've been a reporter for six years. All the news outlets I've worked for are gone, one after the other. It feels like my identity is fading away too. This is the third time Alan, which is not his real name, lost his job in just six months. He was an investigative reporter for Apple Daily, but the police detained several editors and the paper closed. I used to work closely with the people arrested, 
It's terrifying and the threat feels so imminent. At first I thought things would get better after a while, but then you heard of former colleagues being brought to the police station and going missing. It's like they're clearing frontline journalists. Pro-democracy publications like Apple Daily, Stan News and Citizen News went dark after enormous government pressure. Authorities have insisted that press freedom remains protected. A recent survey by the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondents Club found otherwise. More than 70 percent of the journalists said they were worried about being arrested or prosecuted for their work under the national security law. Nearly half the respondents were considering leaving the city. Tsang Chi Ho fled to Taiwan six months ago, shortly after he was sacked by the public broadcaster RTHK. He hosted a popular satirical show, which is why the authorities targeted him. Before I left, I was counting down my days. When is it my turn to be charged? But no one has the answer. Not yourself, not your editor-in-chief, not the police. It's stressful to live with such uncertainty. Cheng Chi Ho now has his own YouTube channel. He posts clips and comments on Hong Kong's current affairs. I now have the freedom that people in Hong Kong don't have. I feel obliged to speak out for them. I still collaborate with people in Hong Kong, and I must consider their safety under the security law. That's their unfortunate fate. Alan says his first priority is his mental health after all the trauma, but he plans to keep reporting the stories of overseas Hong Kongers. Being a journalist is more than just a job title. It's also a way of life, to seek the truth, to think critically and to care for the underprivileged. We can see things through these lenses and continue reporting even without our job titles. But it will be a struggle for Alan to build a readership without resources. It's a fate shared by many of his fellow journalists back in Hong Kong, only they haven't gotten out yet.